My name is Margarita Longoria, and I'm really excited to see all of you guys here today. Um, I'm the editor of this book called Living Beyond Borders, Growing Up Mexican in America, and I have here with me two of my contributors to the, the anthology, David Bowles and Trinidad Gonzalez, and his daughter, she comes with us sometimes. <laughs> She's one of our, yeah. our panelists, too. But um, we're really excited to be here to talk to you guys about this book today. Um, I, uh, I'm a high school librarian. Before that, I was a high school English, no, I wasn't a high school, I was an eighth grade English teacher. And I um, always was looking for culturally relevant literature for my students. I taught in Alton, at Alton Junior High. And although my kids loved everything, we read everything. We read The Outsiders, which is my favorite book in the whole world. And I think The Outsiders is a, is a universal book. Anybody can relate to it because it's a, it's, a, it's a beautiful story. My students loved it. And then we also read like The Giver. We read a bunch of good American literature. But um, a lot, so I had one kid tell me that, you know, she never saw brown kids in characters and stories. And I thought about it. I had never honestly had thought about it because I was, I grew up a reader and I read everything and maybe there wasn't brown kids in stories, but I, I don't know why it didn't dawn on me because my, my students are smarter than I am. So they were like, they're the ones who told me. And I was like, you know what, you're right. So then I start looking for for books with brown characters. And we found, of course, Dr. Denis Saldana. He's also in the story, in the anthology. He was one of my professors in college and he used to teach in, at Mission High School and in, he's from La Jolla. So he, um, he had a book called The Jumping Tree. It had just come out from Random, Penguin Random House and we read that one. The kids loved it. And we would write to Dr. Saldana and he, he was, he, at that time he was teaching, well right now he's teaching at Tex Texas Tech in Lubbock. So I would send him letters and then he would send letters back to my kids and that was a lot of fun because they were able to talk with an author. It was before Zoom, before any of all that. So um, we didn't get to Zoom with him, but he did write him letters. And so always, you know, looking for books and stories that my students and our students here in the area could relate to. So fast forward 16 years later and I was, um, it was during the, the election, the election time um, last election and there was just a lot of negative things being said on the news about Mexican people. We were being called rapists and criminals and bad people and bad hombres and just all those things and I remember getting very very angry and I wanted to fight back somehow and I was just a little English, a little librarian from here in Mission, Texas. I was like how do I, um, how do I fight back? Well I, I love words and I love books and I love stories so I thought to myself I want to put together an anthology of beautiful stories about the Mexican-American culture and I want everybody to read it so they can see into our world and see that we're just like everybody else. These are stories of humanity, they're stories, they, they're just regular stories about families, kids growing up, he, some here along the border in other parts of the country because Mexican-Americans aren't only in the border of Texas, we're all over the country. So I was able to get writers from all over the country. I'm very proud to say that I've got seven writers from the Rio Grande Valley in here. So that was really exciting. But we have, we have from all over the country because we're from all over the country and the different experiences from all over the country, how they grew up young, um, different time, time, also time, time uh, how do I say it? Like different times, like the ages. We have you know, older authors and younger authors. So there's the perspective of different, like, how do I say it? Time. Like time periods. Yeah, yeah. time periods. Yeah, there I go. Time periods. I say this all the time and I don't remember what I say anymore. So um, that's how this book was born. And we're really proud of the stories in here. We're very proud of the work that we did here. It's been well received in the literary community, which is always nice to be well received in the literary community. But we've been well received in like all the book community and that's been really exciting. We have, um, there's a teacher in Oklahoma State University. She contacted me at the beginning of the semester that she was gonna use it in one of her doctoral classes about racism. So I was very excited about that. We have a teacher here at um, UTRGV, Dr. Cummings. She contacted me and she even sent me her syllabus and I was all excited because the book was on a syllabus. And I was like, woohoo, we're on a syllabus. <laughs> Come in. And um, that was really exciting too that we, uh, they, re they were reading it. And so I was able to Zoom with her classes because they read it at the beginning of the semester. So that was exciting. And um, another class, another university, um, U of H, somebody contacted me that they were using it over there too. So that was really exciting. Plus, several teachers here in Roma. Um, I know uh, 
I went to La Fer no, yeah, La Feria High School. They're using it in their English classrooms, and so I was real excited about that because I feel that we, you know, books and stories are mirrors and windows into the world. So people. Tell them about the, the national. Uh, oh yes. Yeah. I was, okay, you know, as an English teacher, and I know I love Dr. Seuss, and we all love Dr. Seuss, right? And then, of course, all this cancel culture, and they got mad at Dr. Seuss a couple years ago, so now we're not allowed to love Dr. Seuss, or they took his, they took his name off of the national um, education, uh, out of, off of reading, Read Across America. It used to be, it's always celebrated on Dr. Seuss's birthday, and it's called Read Across America. Well, they took it, his name off a couple years ago, but it's still this national initiative all over the country. And our book was chosen to be one of the books this year for Read Across America. So that was really exciting as an English teacher. And, uh, and so I was, that was a lot of fun. And it's been picked for a lot of stuff. So we're, we're very blessed and very happy and we're very honored that this came to be. And I was very, I, um, I found my, like, these are my, I call them my 956 crew. <laughs> my people from, from here. But I, uh, I looked for people and I remember I specifically wanted I looked for specific people and I wanted specific stories and I, um, David and I go way back. He's an award-winning writer. He, he's from the Valley. I met Sylvia. She wrote a story not too long ago and I read it and I loved it. And, I, and then that she was, the fact that she was from Wessico and I, and then Trini and I, his dad and my dad play high school football, Bobcat football together. <laughs> so that was also, and, and then he happens to be a Mexican-American scholar expert of the country just happened and I, I was like how does that happen how did I get so lucky <laughs> that he's like a Mexican-American scholar I was like Trini has to be in it too so that's how this group got together <laughs> cool yeah and I mean some of some of the things that uh, Margie is glossing over is the fact that she's been a major force for um, the literary community down here for students for literacy um, she's created the board book bash which is a premier um, book festival for teens down here in the valley that's held every year. Unfortunately, it's had to be virtual, you know, for the past couple of years, but it's it's a really great celebration. But she's been really instrumental in promoting the work of uh, valley writers and, and Texas writers and Mexican American writers uh, more generally. Um, and so definitely when she uh, reached out to us with this idea for the anthology, we were all, we were down for it. Hey, Dan. Um, He'll grab a chair and pull it up over here in a second. <laughs> we're we're going to put him on the spot. Grab a chair! Then, yeah. <laughs> Arrímese un poquito. <laughs> She's mic'd up, so she wants us to be able to pass the... the I'm mic'd up, so you guys... Oh. Yeah. We're like the Keystone Cops. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, yeah, I mean, I, I don't I want her to underplay the, the important role that she... That she carries out in, in our community and she's beloved and and it's just, so when she reached out to us we we're like yeah and and um she <laughs> she literally was just she just wanted to get get stories to bring them together so she could share with kids um and she was all like oh you know well, I, whatever i'll just go to kinko's and or to, to fedex now or whatever it's called right and and and, and, and buying them were like no you need to get this published it, with a major publisher um and i think that um guadalupe garcia mccall even recommended her her agent to you, so uh, it's it's really great, and and it's gotten starred reviews. It's been reviewed in all the major um, journals and and uh, and um, newspapers. So uh, yeah, it's it's a big deal. I mean, she, it, she is she's done something really really marvelous. Um, I've presented here a couple times. Some of you remember me from other presentations I've done at this museum. Um, I my name is David Bowles. I'm a professor at UTRGV. I teach in the Literatures and Cultural Studies department. I was an English teacher at middle school and high school for, for many years here in the Valley. I'm from the Valley. A lot of my relatives <laughs> live here. My grandmother Garza, died in this town. You know, it's like, uh, mission is really, really an important part of, of my life. So it's great to be, to be back here. Um, the, the, the work that I've done has always centered the Valley and, and uh, you know, the Mexican-American heritage of the Valley, especially, mm -hmm. although obviously the Valley is rich in lots of other traditions and, um, including the indigenous one that largely gets, you know, erased over time. Um, and like Margie was saying, you, you know, things kind of came to a head. People, 
treat this region, especially, and, and like the region is one of the things that really gets on my nerves is the way that people talk about the border as if it's some kind of like post-apocalyptic landscape where there are like warlords on the back of like jeeps shooting people on the streets. Like, and, and we are living these like lovely, sweet lives as we have for generations, for hundreds of years, you know? I mean, this area was, you know, the, the first... Mestizo and, and Tlaxcaltec uh, settlers to this area came 250 years ago, you know, with Escando. And I mean, it's, um, and, um, and then indigenous people have been living here for thousands of years. And those three strands kind of blended together and became the ranching um, community that, that was this area for, you know, from much of the 19th century. Um, and it, it, for people to act like we just suddenly sprung up and it's just like this, you know, just it's pure immigrants and this people trying to encroach on U.S. sovereignty. It's just like maddening to me that like people are so historically inept and illiterate um, and, and that they treat the Mexican-American community in the U.S. as if we're like invaders when literally our ancestors have been here from the, you know, from for, yeah, forever, basically, right? If, if we go back to the indigenous part of our heritage, that's right. Um, and so, you know, the opportunity to, to, like, put a spotlight on all the good things about our community or the, it, it, you know, the good things and also the complexities, the very human nature of our community was too, was too good to resist. Um, and I, I'm just glad that this was created. Um, my short story, uh, which is called The Body by the Canal, is a partially fictionalized um, account of some stuff that happened in the 80s in FAR when I lived in Section 8 housing um, right across from the community center in, in FAR. Um, my brother, um, Fernando, found the, the dead body of a teacher um, who had AIDS. I don't know if you guys remember this. In the 1987, I think it was, um, when a teacher was uh, killed and, and dumped by a canal. Um, and my brother was the one who found it. And so this is kind of like the story of... of a story that uses that as um, a starting point for talking about the kind of community I lived in, the friendships I had, and um, the the complexities of Mexican American identity. And it was it was a a project that I hadn't expected to to write. I usually write like you guys know, like retellings of folk tales or novels that that have like oh, oh, the supernatural elements in it. And when I send so this, like that's what I thought I was getting <laughs> from David. <laughs> so I send her like this, like like you know, piece of basically historical fiction that's really like, emotional. She was like, "Whoa, wow, okay, that yes, that's that's good." Um, but because it was a special project, I wanted to do something special for it. And just as she said, you know, writing about different time periods because we want also for Mexican American kids, the kids from the border, to remember. Um, like where we've been and how far we've come and, and like just the different epics that, that our community has gone through. So it was a, you know, a lot of fun putting it together. Um, and um, Trinidad, you also explored um, a, like a, a different moment in time from when you were younger as well, right? Uh, my name is Trin Gonzalez. I'm from uh, originally born and raised in Edinburgh, as Margie said. Uh, my father and her father were high school friends. Uh, so I've known uh, uh, Margie's dad as a little kid growing up and, and her mom when my dad would go visit them or when her dad would go to my grandfather's house uh, for barbecues and they would tell old stories. Um, but uh, David was referencing uh, my essay. Uh, I'm the, I guess, the lone uh, historian, essayist in, in the piece. It's not poetry. It's not fiction. Uh, and what I, what I was trying to get at was the, the, psychological, the psychological trauma children go through when they're made to not feel they belong in this nation, right? Even though, as David has said, we've been here generations and generations. And generations you know, my ancestors go back to the Spanish settlements. Uh, so I was trying to get at, at that sort of trauma and then how children then deal with it as they grow up. And then also reflecting on my experiences at the Smithsonian Museum, where having gone through those experiences, uh, uh, the first time living away from the valley, uh, in D.C. this case, dealing with both racism on the street and then the polite bureaucratic racism within the Smithsonian Institution itself, right? And then having to deal with, with those issues there, right? Things have changed right now. Now we're gonna have a Latino, Latino museum where we can raise the money, but Congress has, has set, it, set it aside to do that, excuse me. So that's what I was trying to get at in my essay. And then the importance of stories that you grow up when you hear from your, your, your parents, the experiences they went through and being made to feel not as though they're Americans, even though my dad was in the military, my dad was a retired first sergeant uh, spent 25 years in the military. Uh, so I grew up in a military family, right? So I grew up very much patriotic to this country. And I went to Freddy Gonzalez, 
which was a Medal Honor recipient from the Vietnam War uh, from Edinburgh. Uh, but then that's where I experienced the first since the, 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 that, that second grade year when I was there. That's when you start experiencing, like, oh, you, you're not quite American, right? And so I explore that in the essay. Uh, I, I do want to, as we're talking about this whole issue that David was saying as this area is described by outside of the world, I feel that when I leave north of the Nueces that I'm starting to leave civilization, right? So to me, <laughs> north of the Nueces River is, uh, it's, yeah, yeah, you can't find, you can't find good tortillas, they don't know how to make cabrito, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, the it's, truth. it's just, <laughs> yeah, it's, 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 you know, I'm very, I wrote another piece a long time ago for the Mesquite Review for No Hinojosa where I talked about when I was at graduate school coming back in to the, to the valley, um, uh, that first sensation where you get past uh, the checkpoint and you start seeing the landscape and the landscape starts changing, right? And I'm coming back to an area where you have a long history of intellectuals, um, poets, writers, that this is, this is not unique, this isn't new. Uh, as a historian, these ideas go back further, right? Um, and I don't want to get into all the history. That's I've presented here before on different types of history, but but anyway. So I was just trying to get at that at that that essay because I think it's very important to understand. Every time somebody tells a child or somebody else that you really don't belong here, you're creating psychological trauma within that individual, and that needs to stop. Right, and that was the whole point of the essay. So I'll I'll pass it along. I remember he was like, Margie, I don't write fiction, and I was like, I don't care. I want you. I don't care. I want I don't, whatever you want to write. I just wanted him in the anthology so bad. I didn't care what he, I was like, I don't care what you write for me. Write me whatever you want. <laughs> Hello, everyone, and um, thank you all for being here. Thank you to Margie for inviting me and for including me in this amazing anthology. I'm, I'm really excited. My name is Sylvia Sanchez Garza. I grew up in Westlaco, Texas, and I live in Edinburgh. My, uh, my parents were migrant farm workers, and um, they went on, and uh, my dad became, uh, went, because of the army, he was, um, he was a, a army a sergeant in the, in the army, and uh, he was able to get his uh, Pell Grant, and he went on to become a superintendent of schools, and he uh, became an author. He became a longtime mayor of uh, Westlake City, and the library in Westlaco is named after my dad. So I'm very proud of, of that. He recently passed away. Um, but I grew up uh, along with my siblings listening to his stories. He was a natural storyteller. And we, we, were, we were raised with not, not just him, my mom as well. They were both storytellers. But... Um, he was the one in the limelight, and she was the one who was, you know, always um, behind him, supporting him. But she was a, a natural storyteller as well. So it was just natural for us to be listening to him. And I wish that I would have, you know, as a child, paid more attention at that time. <clears throat> and that's what I tried to tell my kids. And uh, now I have two granddaughters, little baby granddaughters as well, and that I hope that they do the same. You know, and all of our kids, I sit on a school board, and at this time, yeah, you know, I'd like to recognize Dr. Uh, Philomen Leo is here, and she sat on the, uh, on the school board with me for a long time, and she also was a teacher with me also in, in La Jolla. We taught uh, high school English together, and an uh, amazing uh, mentor here for me. Thank you, Dr. Dr. Leo. She's done amazing work in the community. So, um, yes, um, sh um, we, we did that together as well, but, but my parents had a big, you know, part of, of my life, and um, they taught us that that was very important and serving our community as well. So, in, in this book, um, I have a story that is titled Ojo, and that's something that growing up here in the valley, you know what Ojo is, but if you're not from here, you really don't know what that is. And it's, the story is based, it's a fictional story, but it's, it's, it's based on a fictional, um, of what was my first experience, but it's mal de ojo, and it's kind of 
it's sort of like an evil eye, like if somebody has an uh, evil eye, but it really doesn't really translate the same um, because it's part of the, our culture. So we're raised with um, if someone looks at a baby in a certain way and they think that baby's beautiful and just, just a beautiful baby, which all babies are, you have to touch that baby or else that baby might get ojo. You know, might, you know, if you better touch that baby, that's, that's how exactly we were how raised, <laughs> you know, because no le quieres dar mal de ojo, you know, that's how we were raised. So that's something that was kind of uh, in me, and that's where that story came to be. Um, and growing up here in the valley, that's just part of our culture. And there's a lot of little things that are part of the Mexican-American culture that it's really hard to explain to to other parts. Outsiders with their babies in their carts and yeah. people are coming up and touching their babies like, why are you touching my baby? Yeah. yeah. Because I don't want to give them a home. <laughs> yeah, you can't give them a home, you know, and... Uh, I'm doing this for you. Yes. <laughs> yes. 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 And uh, that's, that's anyway, so it's based on, on, on that. Um, and uh, I remember, you know, going through that as a child, you know, where you do, your parents think or your mom thinks that maybe someone gave you a whole, well, you have to be cured of that now. And there's a whole process of to get that cured. you have to it's go true. through to we get cured. And that's part of our culture as well. So. And the funny thing about that was, you know, I sent these stories to an editor in New York, right? That's where my book was. Um, so my edit, and I had to have a sensitivity reader. They go over the stories to make sure there's you know, nobody's going to get offended. I mean, there's a bunch. Like, it was a big process. And her story was the most controversial of all of my stories. And they were like, what is this? And I'm like, I, and, they, and they wanted to change this. And I was like, no, you can't change it. And then she was like, well, I go, you know, and I would finally say, you know, it's not for you. Like, I, this story, like, this book, this anthology, like, I have a vision. It's my anthology. And this is what I want. Like, you're not going to change her voice. That, the authenticity of that story, you're going to change it if you, if you, I'm sorry you don't understand, but it's not for you to, it's for you to learn, to learn what it is and to learn our culture and, and you will, you know, like, no, we're not changing it, but oh my God, it was so some, funny. Some things just are really hard to translate, you know, to yeah. other cultures, but going back to that, um, as a school board member and uh, Dr. Leo can relate to this, when we go to conferences uh, across the nation, even you know, in, uh, in North Texas, people will ask us, so where are you from? So we say, well, we're from South Texas, you know, because if we say Edinburgh or Mission, they really don't know what that is. So we'll say South Texas. Oh, so you're from San Antonio? <laughs> you're from Houston? Uh, further south. Uh, oh, well, where is that? So that people do not know yeah. where we are. They, they just don't understand. And they, they're missing so many opportunities because the Rio Grande Valley is, is a gem that, that's really uh, people don't understand and don't know us yet. They don't know us yet. Uh, many do. Many do. But, but we're getting the name out there. And our kids are going to thrive because of that. So I'm going to pass the mic over to Daniel. Thank you all. So um, I guess I'll start with, I got to touch Margie's boots here. <laughs> Don't give them all you know? because I had to get new I mean, ones. <laughs> unicorn, pink unicorn yes, Texas pink. boots. <laughs> I mean, come on. That, we need a close-up on this for, for, the, for the record. Um, so, yeah, and mom's here, my sister. Hi, mom. Hi, Martha. <laughs> so, uh, you know, my, our DNA, we have these beautiful long eyelashes. These are natural. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> yes, him and his brother. And uh, you know, and I'm only mentioning it because of the Ojo thing. Like, so we grew up, we grew <laughs> up Baptist. You know, yeah, we grew up Baptist. Like, we didn't grow up with the Ojo thing, though we were aware aware of it. You know, being in the valley, right? So it, it wasn't something that we sort of, you know, we blocked that, you know, that spirit, right? But uh, that didn't stop mom from letting strangers just, you know, they just come up at H E B or whatever, and. <laughs> And this is way, of course, pre-COVID times, right? These days, <laughs> these days, you know, somebody's going to be removing earrings and there's going to be some words <laughs> exchanged, right? But um, yeah, the whole thing is, is just pretty, pretty interesting that way. 
So um, my name is Daniel Garcia Ordaz, um, and so we're here in the shadow of you know these amazing uh, uh, veterans and uh, some uh, missing in action and some uh, you know who who passed away in were lost in combat as well. And so there's a poster, for example, uh, an army official army poster of Jose Mendoza Lopez. Uh, the official records, if you Google his name, will say that he entered the army in Brownsville, Texas. But all Valley, all Valley soldiers in World War II took that train station trip from, you know, from from uh, little and small towns. Ended up in places like Harlingen, San Benito, on the way to Brownsville for the big, the big train, right? The one where the where they wrote the names down, right? And so his story is amazing. Um, um, he killed official the official record of his Medal of Honor citation. Uh, basically, his story is so he's an orphan from Mexico uh, who was eventually raised by family friends here in Mission. And there's a, a small, tiny little uh, street named down the, down the way, named for him. Um, and so he grew up, like I said, here in Mission, was a professional boxer, had a pretty good record, went to the Merchant Marines, and eventually, you know, went into the U.S. Army World War II. His citation says that he killed at least... 99 Germans in one battle during the Battle of the Bulge, at least. And this guy was going up against tanks, uh, you know, all shot up, stabbed, machine gun is done, picked up another gun, and so on. He's going up against tanks, y'all, with grenades and stuff. This is how much Mexican Americans, you know, were taking for granted after his service in World War II, Medal of Honor recipient. And we know that many deserving, you know, uh, Americans of Japanese descent, Americans of African American descent, Americans of Mexican descent, you know, were not, were not, you know, honored with the Medal of Honor. They were perhaps given the Silver Star, et cetera. They were passed over because of the color of their skin or the name, right, on their record. Um, you know, something like this, of course, could not be ignored, right? But this is how much he, you know, he was taken for granted. He ended up in Korea and in battle until some general, you know, read his record and said, hey, buddy, like, you're an American hero, like, we need you, you know, safe back home somewhere, you know, and so he, you know, as you drive in, and I pointed out a hundred million times, uh, like, a, like, like, an, uh, like any dad does, um, the, the, the Jose M. Lopez Memorial Highway in San Antonio area, which is where he ended up, you know, raising his family and retiring and so on, and so, uh, and, 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 you know, there's a picture of my my, my tío uh, Rigoberto Ordaz from uh, Vietnam and so on. Um, so growing up here in Mission, uh, salud. Este, growing up here in Mission, uh, grow, going to Mission High School, there, there's that street that's right in front of the school, Cleo Dawson. And so uh, just a few days ago, uh, Dean Stockwell, the actor from um, Quantum Leap, is it? Well, you're certainly in Quantum Leap. Yeah, yeah. And, 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 and many, many. Yeah, uh, the, and so amazing, amazing actor. So he was in a movie, a little movie called She Came to the Valley, based on a book, Cleo Dawson, and if you're from Mission, you already know this story better than me. But um, uh, so people from my generation, uh, we, you know, some of the, my classmates were like extras, like, oh, I ran across the street, you know, or whatever, uh, in the movie or whatever. Um, and so Freddie Fender, you know, plays Pancho Villa and so on, and Dean Stockwell is the husband of the main character, She Came to the Valley. And so... The Homestead Act had brought you know people to places like down here, right? To, to we were I guess one of the last places perhaps in the U.S. that had like covered wagons with quote unquote pioneers, you know, coming down here. So it's a it, cool story. And so I grew up, you know, as a kid here in Mission, like uh, in, as a history buff. I'm an English teacher, but uh, I, I should have probably you know gone into the history thing. Who knows? But uh, I love. English, yeah. English people all, love history because I love history too. Yeah, it's, and it's if gotta, I wasn't an English teacher, I would have been a history teacher. And I, and I guess we sort of unoffic unofficially always, you know, we establish, set the background and stuff, that sort of thing. So uh, my poem is called uh, Rio Grande Valley. And so not everything in this book, in the anthology, is, is Rio Grande Valley based. But uh, my particular poem is, and ma mainly I'm a poet. Um, uh, I started as a reporter, so like nonfiction type stuff. And I just like other people's stories. I like biographies. Um, so grew up, you know, like I said, here in Mission, moved down here in Monterreyito, moved to uh, Mission Acres later on. And so um, we were migrant students, you know, migrant farm workers. And, and more often than not, we weren't necessarily traveling, traveling to Minnesota, Wisconsin, or, or et cetera. But 
or my younger siblings, California, but we were mostly down here. Like I picked onions from Rio Grande City all the way to Mercedes. And so those were my Saturdays and Sundays most of the time uh, growing up. And so um, as a high school English teacher now, uh, over at La Jolla Early College High School, um, and um, you know, I'm actually teach. I just finished teaching one of the stories in here. So uh, we, I, you know, we have to rebel against the curriculum because it's all about the star test and so on. And and uh, even though I teach 11th and 12th graders, like there's still some kids in there who are who are needing to you know finish. So I'm I just finished teaching, um, actually, uh, Milady. Uh, and so um, there's a story in here about a young girl who who has a quinceanera celebration, you know, in school. And so. Um, a few years ago when I started teaching, there was a story, stories by Javier Garza, by René Saldana that were available in David Rice. Um, and, uh, and, and it was, you know, high interest from the students and so on. Uh, it's been a while since I had the younger grades, and so I went ahead and taught these two juniors who are struggling. And y'all, you've never seen, you know, kids like really just embrace a story and just really be into it uh, as, as I've seen here. And so... Um, I maybe what is the fear? I don't know if y'all know about the Texas legislature and so on, like wanting to ban certain books. This is very, very much in the news this last week and this week, and uh, hopefully it'll come up here later on, and y'all could chime in on that. And so, what? Why do people want to ban books? You know, like like this. Well, you know, um, I guess the fear is like, well, the demographics are changing and so on. Like, there's talk about like critical race theory and stuff like that. What happened here with me? So I, I read, you know, Robert Frost. I read Walt Whitman. I, I read Emily Dickinson. And they have informed me. They have influenced me as a writer. And I, and I love what, you know, what they, they, they brought to the table. Um, you know, but here I am, Mexican-American. My first language is Spanish. When I joined the Navy, all of a sudden, I got this Texas accent. I don't know what, what was that, that was about. <laughs> and, I, you know, and, so, um, and so I still carry Walt Whitman and Robert Frost, but also, I, you know, Langston Hughes and Maya Angelou. And just more recently, really in college, is when I started reading Hispanic authors. And literally, there were two, like, two poems from kinder through 12th grade, like, two poems by Hispanic, you know, authors is all I was ever exposed to. And, um, you know, that's it. And so we need to see ourselves on the cover, right? We need to see our names on, on covers like this of books, of, of nationally represented books, um, we need to hear stories about quinceañeras. We need to, you know, it's so important, right, for, for all kids to see themselves on TV, in the movies, in the commercials, in the books, in positive ways. And so that's why I'm, you know, honored to be part of this project. Thank you, Margie. Thank you. It was a very, very fun project. Uh, we started before it was May, it was, I rem okay, Lupita, she's in this book. Her name is Guadalupe Garcia McCall. She's a, an award-winning Mexican-American writer. She's amazing, and she's my mentor, and she's, I, she's, like my, she's my big sister. I love her so much. And I called her, and I was like, I have this idea. What do you think, right? And she was like, I love it. Let's, let's do it. And I was like, okay, what do I do? Because <laughs> I, you know, it was just, I don't know what to do. And she goes, well, you need to go ask everybody we know. Uh, like if they want to contribute to this. And the Mexican-American community is very small. So I did pretty much ask everybody we knew. And um, some said yes, some said no. And I remember I was at school, it was November 2018, and she calls me. She's in New York with her agent talking about the different, her different projects. And she just mentioned that she was gonna contribute to this anthology. So her agent was like, well, what anthology? So she was telling her a little bit. So then the agent, she's like, my agent wants to talk to you. And I was like, I don't know what an agent is. I mean, I know what an agent is, but I was like, girl, I don't have money to pay an agent. Please don't have me call, talk to an agent. Like, I didn't know what was, I, it was just beyond my little mind. And so um, she, uh, the agent calls me and I was like, oh, I don't know. And then I called David and David was like, Margie, you sign with the agent. Like, what's wrong with you? So I was like, okay. So I did. And because I was like, I don't have a book. I have an idea. And one person, two people that said yes. You know, like, I don't have, it was very, and it had to stay a secret. And it was every, I mean, it was a year. We kept this all, everybody, it was a year that like, we could not talk about it. And so one day she's like, I know I can sell it to one of the big five. And I was like, wow. Because I had already talked to another publishing house, a little publishing house in El Paso. And she kind of was like, well, I don't know. I'll talk to you. Like, I'll call you after the holidays. And I don't know. And I, 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 called, the, I called the publisher like, 
hi, my name is Maria and I want to do this. And she was, I thought for sure she would like say okay because she was a border, uh, you know, whatever. And she was kind of like, no, I'll, I'll call you later. So I was like, okay. And so then like, I remember all this happened and then she did call me later. And I was like, oh, I have an agent. Do you need to talk to my agent? <laughs> I couldn't talk to her anymore. I really couldn't. <laughs> I, was, I, I have to add that the same publisher was the one that that rejected the smoking mirror, and then when it went on to like win the the Purple uh -huh. they were all like, uh, "You wouldn't happen to have another book that we could, like, yeah." Yeah, I was like, mm. but yeah, so I was. It was so like, oh, but anyway, so I kind of didn't understand when she was talking about Big Five, but she did. My agent's amazing. She went and she sold it to Penguin Random House, who's the biggest publisher in the world, basically, and um, and here we are today. Fast forward, I remember it was like two thousand. It was. No, when was it? November 2019. And they were like, it's going to come out 2021. And I was like, oh my God, that's forever. But you know, this was pre-pandemic. And so if the world was, was like, a, we were normal. And then all of a sudden we went into this lockdown and, and it was, so all of this was done during pandemic. We had, you know, I lost my cousin during this time. While we were editing, while we were, you know, I lost my cousin to COVID. Lupita lost her dad. My agent lost her dad and my editor lost her dad. And um, I, uh, you lost your, yeah. And then um, I, I had several contributors, so it was hard. It's hard to get creative people to be creative when you're sad. So that was, it was, but we, um, we did it and it was, and I, and I even was like, you know, if everybody, if anybody needs to like back out, I understand, because we, we didn't expect what happened to happen. But no, everybody, um, everybody went through with what they promised and, and we have our beautiful book and we're so excited. <laughs>